Hey guys, and welcome to Honey Gastro. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic, and that is diphilobothriasis, which is also commonly known as the fish tapeworm infection. So let's get started. So what is the fish tapeworm infection? Diphilobothriasis is an infection with the intestinal tapeworms of the Diphilobothridae family, most commonly Diphilobothrium latum and Diphilobothrium nihonkiense. Diphilobothrium latum and related species are the largest tapeworms that can infect humans and may grow up to reach lengths of as much as 30 feet, which is about 9.14 meters long. The infection occurs in humans when an individual eats raw or undercooked fish that is contaminated with this parasite. So from this definition of diphilobothriasis, we get that it's an infection caused by this intestinal tapeworm of the diphilobothridae family, most commonly diphilobothrium latum and diphilobothrium nihonkiense. So these parasites are actually the largest tapeworms that can infect humans and they grow up to about 9.14 meters long, which is huge. So this intestinal tapeworm is a parasite and humans actually get this parasite when they eat undercooked or raw fish that's contaminated with cysts from this parasite. So now that we know what the basics of the fish tapeworm infection is, let's take a closer look at how one can contract the disease. So humans become infected when they eat raw or undercooked freshwater fish that contain fish tapeworm cysts. So after a person has eaten the infected fish, the larvae actually begins to grow in the intestines of the human. The larvae are then fully grown in about three to six weeks, and then we have the manifestation to the adult worm. So the adult worm, which is segmented, as we can see in the image here, and in the previous slide, here are the basic segments of the adult worm, and they attach to the wall of the intestine. So the tapeworm may reach lengths of up to 30 feet, which is about 9 meters long, as we said, and the eggs are formed in each segment of the worm and are passed into the stool of the human. So sometimes parts of the worm may also be passed in the stool. So if we take a closer look at this image to the left of my screen, we're going to start here where it says the unembryonated eggs are passed into the feces of the definitive host. So that's the last point here. So now we have these eggs or even parts of these segments of the worm which are passed into the feces of the host. So these eggs actually embryonate in the water. And then once that step is complete, we have the coracidia which hatch from the eggs and are ingested by the first intermediate hosts, which are crustaceans. And the crustaceans are actually a diverse anthropod family, which include crabs, lobsters, crayfish, shrimps, prawns, etc. And they are all examples of the first intermediate host. So from this step, we have the procercoid larvae, which develop in the body cavities of these crustaceans. And the procercoid larvae are released from the crustaceans, and they develop into pleurocercoid larvae. And the infected crustaceans are actually ingested by the second intermediate host, which are usually these small fish. So these small fish come by and eat these crabs and shrimps, etc., actually ingesting all these parasitic larvae into them. So once we have these small fish which ingest these crustaceans, a larger fish or, or even directly a human ingests these smaller fish. But from this step, we can go to the larger fish, which are predator fish, and they are called the paratonic hosts, and they usually eat these small fish and the pleurocercoid larvae invades their tissues. So from this step, we can either have the fish being eaten by humans and the infection being caused in humans, or we can have various other mammals which ingest these fish. So we can have many fish eating mammals and birds, which can also be definitive hosts. So in this picture here, it actually shows us what the scolex looks like. And the scolex is the point at which this tapeworm actually attaches to the intestine. So it actually grips onto the intestine and stays there and absorbs all the nutrients from the patient. And so the cycle continues. So now we have these definitive hosts which can pass these unembryonated eggs in their feces and so the cycle goes on. So this is how one can actually contract the disease by eating raw or undercooked fish. So now let's talk about some signs and symptoms of the fish tapeworm infection. So fish tapeworm infections rarely present with noticeable symptoms. The tapeworms are most often discovered when people notice eggs or segments of the tapeworm in their stool. But some patients may suffer from symptoms which include diarrhea, fatigue, stomach cramps and pain,
chronic hunger or a lack of appetite, unintended weight loss, weakness, pallor, glossitis, disturbances of movement and coordination, loss of vibratory sense and proprioception, and the fish tapeworms can take up a lot of the dietary vitamin B12, and this usually results in a vitamin B12 deficiency for the patient and the onset of a megaloblastic anemia. So these tapeworms, while they stay hooked onto the intestine, they actually absorb a lot of the B12. So these patients will actually go into a B12 deficiency and suffer a megaloblastic anemia, therefore. So rarely, in heavy infections, we can actually lead to an intestinal obstruction or a gallbladder disease due to the migration of the proglottids. So little parts of these tapeworms actually migrate into the gallbladder and can actually block the various channels within the gallbladder system. But then they can also lead to an intestinal obstruction, which means the worm is so large that it completely blocks the lumen of the small intestine. And this usually happens in very rare cases. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of the fish tapeworm infection. So the diagnosis of diphalobothriasis is done by the identification of the characteristic operculated eggs or broad proglottids, which are tapeworm segments in the stool. So this is actually what the classic operculated eggs look like, and this is found on the stool sample. And this here is a fertilized egg of the Diphalobothrium latum, which is encountered in the feces of a 29-year-old woman living in Salvador, which is northeast Brazil. And these eggs are ovoid, with an operculum at one end and a knob at the other end, which is shown in the arrow. So here we have the knob and here we have the operculum. And they measure about 58 to 76 millimeters in length and about 41 to 51 millimeters in diameter. So we can also find pieces or segments of the proglottids, which are segments of the tapeworm in the stool. But this is actually an example of a large piece of tapeworm, which is found in the stool. And then we can also do a complete blood count, which is done to check for that megaloblastic anemia. Because as we said, these tapeworms love to absorb a lot of the patient's vitamin B12. So we can actually test the blood to check for a low vitamin B12 level, which can give us some sort of indication of this fish tapeworm infection. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of the fish tapeworm infection. So the treatment for diphalobothriasis is done with a single dose of praticuantil, 5 to 10 milligrams per kg of the patient. Alternatively, a single 2 gram dose of niclosamide is given, as well as 4 tablets, 500 milligrams each, that are chewed one at a time and swallowed. And for children, the dose is 50 milligrams per kg, maximum 2 grams at once. And that brings us to the end of this video on the fish tapeworm infection. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. And please make sure you turn on your bell notifications so you'll be notified every time we have a new upload. If you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.